Thanks so much for coming. We, we've been really excited about this event and our collaboration with Dr. Lucas and Dr. Williams. So, and it's our first trial with our remote clients joining in from a Zoom meeting, so we can see folks from all over the country too. So nice to see you guys. All right, so I'm going to speak first, and then Dr. Luke as well, and then Dr. Williams will be our great finale. And just for the essence of time, if you could hold your questions to the end, and then we'll all come up and, and hopefully answer those for you. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so you probably, a lot of you have heard what I am going to be talking about tonight, but repetition is the mother of skill, so <laughs> here we go. So, um, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about my background. We're going to talk about the current rates and costs associated with obesity, and I know Dr. Lucas is going to talk specifically on diabetes, and then we'll talk about the, the current problem with conventional dietary recommendations, the role of carbohydrates and insulin in metabolic dysfunction, a little bit about the research, and if I can get to it, we'll talk about some really fun case studies, which is my favorite part. So um, I began my adolescence training in classical ballet. I was a professional ballet dancer. I went to boarding school for it during high school. I completed my BFA from the University of Utah in ballet performance, danced with the Aspen Santa Fe Ballet, and did the Nutcracker quite a few times here, and then moved on to the Richmond Ballet and danced there for a while. And if I had known now what I know about nutrition, I think my career dancing would have been longer. Unfortunately, it was a little bit short. I got injured all the time. And so when I retired from that career, I went on to nutrition because I understood how significantly it impacted my own sport performance. So I went to Virginia Tech and finished my PhD there, uh, focusing on sports nutrition and chronic disease, and then we moved to Ohio. I've been following around my husband for all of his medical training while doing my own training too. So we ended up in Ohio for a while, and I taught at the Ohio State University and then understood how I really love to impact lives and see dramatic change. And so went back to school again and completed my dietetic internship. And we moved to California, and that's when I came up with this protocol that we now implement in our clinics. And we have a clinic here in Durango, and we have another one in Farmington. We just opened a clinic in Ormond Beach, Florida, and we're going on to Asheville to begin opening a few clinics in that area as well. So we're going to begin today by just looking at the trends in obesity in the U.S. starting from 1985 and the most current data we have is 2016. So I'll walk you through what these maps mean. So the light blue means that less than 10% of the population is dealing with obesity. And we define obesity as carrying around 30 pounds of extra fat mass or more. The next shade of blue means that 10 to 14% of us are struggling. Dark blue, 15 to 19 percent. Yellow, 20 to 24 percent. Orange, 25 to 29. And the polka dot red means that more than 30 percent of the population is dealing with a 30 pound uh, or more additional fat mass. And in, I think it's 2011, we had to add another color. So I'll walk you through as we go. Okay. Here, here we go. Here we added the darker red and another green. So now when you see the darker red, it means that more than 35% of us are struggling. And here we are, that's the most recent data. So you can see that Colorado is hanging on strong. <laughs> Okay, so then now we know that a, the, the, I'd say, well, I have 40% of the population is struggling with obesity right now, and that's probably actually higher. And so when we look at the costs associated with it, it's significant. About We spend, or our provider helps us spend about $8,000 per year if we have diabetes. If we have uh, high blood pressure, about $700 a year. And if we have high cholesterol and we're on statin therapy, that's an average of about $1,000 a year. A lot of us have all three. That's called metabolic syndrome. So on average, maybe we are a provider spending about $9,000 a year. A lot of us are commonly diagnosed at the age of 55. So by the time we've had these conditions for 20 years, we spent about $200,000 a year in total costs associated with comorbidities of these conditions. Annually in the US, and now again it's more, we spend about $150 billion a year just on these, th uh, um, these three conditions. 
So right now, one in three Americans are struggling with obesity, and twice that number are struggling with overweight and obesity. Um, this has only increased. In 2007, our rates were around 33.7%. Right now, more than 40 million children under the age of five are struggling with obesity. In 2030, it's predicted that 50% of the U.S. population is going to be within these brackets here. So the real issue is that we're promoting this dietary one-size-fits-all approach when I would argue that it doesn't even fit the majority of the population. So I'm going to begin by discussing four proposed solutions to ill health, inflammation, and weight gain as proposed by proponents of conventional dietary wisdom. And when I say conventional wisdom, I mean our higher, moderate carbohydrate, lower fat approach to the way we should be eating um, by the My Plate and Food Pyramid recommendations. So first, we're told that we need to exercise more. Has anyone been told to exercise more? especially here in Durango, which is so crazy. <laughs> um, so when we really dive into the literature, we know that exercise is not a potent weight loss tool. It's great. It's a great wellness tool. It's helpful for stress, mood, sleep, strength. But from a weight loss perspective, it's not a huge deal. Um, when we look at four tightly uh, controlled inpatient studies, when we looked at uh, calories in and calories out, these individuals should have let go of 10 pounds of fat mass. The average individual lost about seven pounds, and there was a large group that lost only two to three pounds, despite exercising and eating the same amount. A lot of people are exercise, uh, are, their exercise response depends upon their genetics, which I think is seen through that study. It's a huge appetite stimulator. When we exercise more, we get significantly hungrier. Has, have you guys experienced that? When you yeah, exercise more, you're more ravenous. Um, did you know that you would have to run 350 miles or cycle 1,000 miles to burn off 10 pounds of fat? Wow. And I always say in Durango, maybe we actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty fair. So really what we need to do is we need to fix our metabolism first, and then we exercise for the enjoyment of it because we love it and because it makes us feel good. So next, we're told to eat less. Has anyone been instructed to eat less? Yes. Yeah, so again, if we dive into the literature looking at severe caloric restriction, we find increased feelings of anxiety and depression. We see poor weight loss, actually, and we see huge risk of weight regain. The reason why is because it doesn't fix our hunger and our cravings, and ultimately it's unsustainable, it leads to frustration, we have to eat. I find we can only starve ourselves for about two months until we have to eat again, and then the weight comes back. Third, we're told that we need to have more willpower. Has anyone been instructed in, in that? Like, you just need to change your personality first. But I will tell you that a leaner individual has no more willpower than a heavier individual. It is not out of laziness. It's not a flaw in personality. There is nothing wrong with that individual. It's all hormonally, uh, uh, it's all related to a hormonal dysfunction. And so that's what we need to fix is the metabolic dysfunction. It has nothing to do with personality. It is not your fault. And then lastly, we're told that we need to eat everything in moderation. And I think that this has done a lot of damage in society because we feel like we're told we just need to do everything in moderation. And if we can't do that, that we're a failure. And we know that it has nothing to do with willpower or discipline, that certain foods uh, correlate with more overeating and cravings and hunger. So really, it's the foods that drive this. Um, and, and we have to recognize our specific gateway, or trigger foods is what I like to call them. Will you guys raise your hand if you know what your gateway food is? And by that, I think, yeah, you all know what I mean. And everyone should be raising their hand because we all have them, and they are very unique, and those are the foods that we eat, and we cannot eat them in moderation. For me, it would be ice cream. If there's ice cream in the house, I will eat it. So if I want to set myself up for success, I better not have it in there. So if we're not just supposed to starve ourselves, if we can't exercise the calories off, if we can't change our personality and eat everything in moderation, what are we supposed to do? Well, I find what is really successful is to change our metabolism. 
we need to shift it over. So primarily there are two metabolic responses to food. We are either a sugar or carbohydrate burner or we are a fat burner. And the majority of us are sugar burners because of what we've been instructed to eat. So when we metabolize carbohydrates, we secrete insulin. And I'll talk a little bit about insulin here in a few minutes. But when we eat carbs, insulin is secreted, and that correlates with an increase in inflammation and weight gain. I want you to think of carbohydrate metabolism like a wood-burning stove down here, right? It's dirty. It's sooty. There's a lot of byproduct. When we metabolize carbohydrates, we produce free radicals. And many of you, I'm sure, have heard about free radicals, and they're associated with a whole host of negative health consequences. It's just like that sooty byproduct of this wood stove. And we know that if we don't keep shoving wood in the fireplace, that energy is going to go out. That's why we have to eat every three to four hours, and why we're told that our metabolism is going to stop if we don't eat every three to four hours. It's just because we're burning carbohydrate, and those carbs are gone in three hours. We have a sugar crash, and we have to eat again. So instead, we want to be fat burners. And to be fat burners, I want you to think about this nice propane stove up there. It's clean, it's easy, the fuel source is longer, and there's no negative byproducts. Nearly every cell in the body prefers to burn fat for fuel. We just don't let it. So I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that carbs are evil and that we shouldn't be eating any carbohydrates. That's not necessarily the case. What happens, though, is carbohydrates have the most profound effect on how we metabolize other nutrients. I want you to think, if you eat carbohydrates above your tolerance level, and everyone is unique as to where their tolerance level is, but if we eat above that, we flip off the switch to burning fat for fuel, and we are that wood-burning stove. Does that make sense? If we eat underneath our carbohydrate tolerance level, then we can keep the switch on to burning fat for fuel, and we are that propane tank that the body really loves. So the carbs really control how we burn fat. So the most profound stimulus to burn fat is reducing our carbohydrates underneath our specific carb tolerance level. Doesn't mean you need to be keto, Atkins, any of that. Again, we're all unique, but we have to find our specific level. And we can look at this from an evolutional standpoint. We had limited access to carbs most of the year for more than 2 million years. The length of time that we've had grains and sugar is just a blip of time in our species, and we are not tolerating them very well at all. So do any of you garden? Good. Anyone go to the farmer's market? So how long is the fruit season? <coughs> pretty darn short and if you're lucky enough to grasp a strawberry out of your garden I have yet to I know I think we got one strawberry it was cute yeah and it was the size of the tip of our pinky finger right so if you think about the size of the fruit the length of the season if you think about what an apple looked like a million years ago maybe it was a little crab apple that was super tart and we had no desire to eat it anyway now how often can we get fruit yeah. How big are the strawberries? Yeah, the size of the palm of your hand. It's a huge fructose load, which Doug will talk about here in a minute. What about my favorite are the Honeycrisp apples? They're delicious. They're the size of our heads. They're enough carbohydrate for all of us in here for about two days. So it's just a different beast that we're in. We have these carbs all around us. So these carbs, they're all around us. They're addictive. We can't get ourselves away from them. They're super convenient. And now the majority of us, right, 70% of us, show some metabolic dysfunction going on. So this is my plate. It's what the government suggests that we eat with all of our meals. Can you guys please point out where we're getting our carbohydrates? Grains, fruits, vegetables, and dairy. So everything except for the protein. And I think it's really interesting. We're all instructed that we should be having dairy every day. Is anyone in here lactose intolerant? Oh, not many, but a few. Yeah, a lot of us can't tolerate dairy, but it's on my plate. So what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> not being able to tolerate that. And then the protein's supposed to be very lean, right? We're supposed to fear our dietary fat, so we're not getting any fat in there because our dairy should probably be, according to this, some skim milk. 
So now I'm going to skip over and talk about visceral fat. And uh, many of you have probably heard the story of this beast here, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. So here are, are images of two hearts. The one on the left is a healthy heart, and the one on the right is an image of what our heart would look like if we're carrying significant visceral fat. When I talk about visceral fat, I mean the deep belly fat. So what happens, generally speaking, is we have these triggers in our life uh, they change the way that we tolerate our food. Our triggers are different for each unique individual. It can be stress, general aging, menopause, pregnancy. I have my fingers crossed that this isn't the one that causes <laughs> that. But whatever it is, it's just a change. And you can continue to eat the same way you did in the past, but now it results in weight gain instead. And so you think, what am I doing wrong? I'm weak, I just don't have the willpower. But it has, again, nothing to do with that whatsoever. So we start to accumulate some of this visceral fat. And here is a, a a model of what five pounds of visceral fat looks like. For those of you who haven't been lucky enough to feel the weight of this, you need to come up after and lift it because it's really heavy. So for every pound of fat that we're carrying on the body, it's about eight pounds of force pushing through the foot and the ankle, about five to six pounds per pound of this pushing through the knee, and every pound of fat we have on the belly is five pounds of force pulling off the spine. So from a joint perspective, and what Dr. Lucas does, it's a huge deal. So what happens is we start to accumulate this stuff, fills up the organs, wraps around them, and squeezes them really tight. So it's like there's this straight, straight jacket in there. And you can see that from that picture. It can't expand and contract like it should be able to do. It, it grows its own blood vessels. These fat cells now start to secrete their own hormones. So I want you to visualize that this belly fat, this deep visceral fat is in there secreting hormones with one goal. And guess what that goal is? That's all it wants to do is get fatter. It's hungry. It has cravings. I think it has a specific carbohydrate count that it has to meet every darn day. Um, it, it's this thing in there that's hungry and it wants to be fed. And so what happens is we start to accumulate this visceral fat, we have more and more hormones, and it becomes this deeper cascade of weight gain instead of weight maintenance. And that's why you feel like you can eat the same way that you did in the past, but now things are partitioned differently. One of the hormones, what it does is it helps to make the energy go to feed the fat cell first. So our muscle cell is left empty and the brain doesn't get a clear signal that you've been fed, so it's hungry. It secretes this hormone called aromatase, and in men that converts testosterone into estrogen. So when a man is holding on to this visceral fat, we pretty much know that their testosterone is lower and estrogen is higher. Um, in women, it does the same thing. That aromatase converts to estrogen, and if we're carrying just 20 pounds of extra fat mass, our risk of breast cancer is two to three times higher, and that's 70% of the population. And then it secretes interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory hormone um, and helps to encourage cancer growth. So it's also why we gain weight and we lose it, is let's say you have a 60-pound fat mass in and it is active, and you let go of 30 pounds, and you think, this feels good, I look pretty good, this is good enough. Well, your risk of weight regain is very high because you still have 30 pounds of that active fat mass left working against you, your metabolism is no different, and you will very, very likely regain your weight. That's why it's important that you get your body where you need to be, despite how great you feel, so that you can change the metabolism. It can be more fast and efficient and not secreting these um, negative hormones. Does that make sense? OK, so let's go through this really quickly. So when we have, do I have time? Yes, OK. okay. So this is, when we have this visceral fat, and we have all these hormones being secreted by it. Um, well, actually, let's take an example of when we don't, where we have no visceral fat. I want you to look at the image of this top figure here. So what happens is, let's say you eat steel-cut oats for breakfast with some vanilla yogurt and some organic blueberries. That goes into the gut and it's metabolized into sugar, right? The body looks at that primarily like glucose. So those are, that is those red dots up there. The body can only tolerate about one to two teaspoons of sugar at any given time. So it doesn't like a lot of sugar in there, and it tells the pancreas to secrete insulin. 
And I want you to think of insulin like a key. And it is the blue dots here. And what it does is it travels around and it binds to the cell wall. So here you're looking at the blood, here's the cell wall, and here's the inside of the muscle cell. So you eat those steel cut oats and blueberries, the insulin travels around, and it binds to the cell wall, and it opens up that little door. And that's the job of insulin, so that glucose can go into the muscle cell and you have all this lovely energy to go expend. What happens when we have this visceral fat is it gets this callus around the cell wall. You eat that same breakfast, but now that insulin, that key, bounces off the cell wall. It can't open it anymore, so the glucose is stuck outside in the blood. Are you following? So now there's the little glucose in the muscle cell. We have low energy, fatigue. The last thing we want to do is go work out. We have all this glucose stuck in the blood, and where is the glucose going to go? That's right, it converts into fat. So gaining fat mass is actually a protective mechanism against this high blood glucose. So if we have diabetes, this glucose is stuck in the blood and it's not flipping over into fat. So I would say that we, can, we could say that this lower cell is insulin resistant, and another word for that would be carbohydrate intolerant. So for those of you too who are lactose intolerant, what do you do with lactose? You try not to eat it, right? Or you don't feel very good. What about gluten? Anyone gluten sensitive? What happens if you eat gluten? You don't feel so good. So do you eat it all the time? No, no. not at all. <laughs> so it's the same thing here. These carbohydrates are making us gain fat mass and not feel good and have inflammation. So what should we do? We should drop them down below our tolerance level. So this will be my last one, how about that? Is that good? Okay, so this is just another way of looking at it. Let's say for breakfast we have a bagel and a skinny latte because, well, we've been told that fat is bad and this is all fat free. Um, or let's, so this is about how much sugar we're getting in this bagel and skinny latte. About 75 grams of carbohydrate or 19 teaspoons of sugar. Or let's say we're going paleo and we don't want to have grains or dairy so we have this green on walla juice I always like to show because it's green and it says superfood on it and I think it says it has kale in there. So little do you know that there's 60 grams of carbohydrate or 15 teaspoons of sugar which looks just about like this much here in this beverage. So we eat that, it goes into the body, and like I mentioned earlier, we can only tolerate one to two teaspoons of sugar. And what happens in a healthy individual when we don't have any visceral fat or inflammation, someone who's just really naturally lean, the majority of us aren't going to float to the left-hand side, though that sugar goes into the muscles. But for the majority of us, it travels over here to the right-hand side can't get into the muscle cells or the muscle cells are at capacity. So that glucose goes to the liver. The liver feels, fills up with this glucose and it has to convert that glucose to something else. So like you guys said earlier, it converts it into fat and we start to see fatty liver. And now the liver is filled with fat and where is that going to go? Well, it helps to get rid of that and it releases it into the bloodstream as triglycerides. Triglycerides are packaged on these little cars called VLDL. So now we see VLDL go up, LDL go up, triglycerides are rising, and we think, what the heck, I ate no fat. It was a skinny bland latte with a bagel with fat-free cream cheese, if you were lucky. And all of this is going awry. So this is, this is what's happening. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.